This episode may contain strong language and adult themes. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Uh, well, hello and welcome to episode 25, believe it or not. We made it through another week and Sam's giggling away in the background because he's almost got in the way. <laughs> How you doing, Sammy? I'm fine. I was just looking at it there, mate. I was, I was just looking at Chris and I'm thinking, my God, he's becoming like the A-team, the medallion man or something. Oh, mate, I don't know. He's become a student, so who the oh, hell knows now? No, I know, I know. It's shocking, isn't it? Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, welcome to episode 25. Say hello, gang. Hello, gang. So we know now that Sam's had a very good day because it's been a, a feast or festival day today. Yes, it, what? Sam? It's like what Scotland won. It was Malta's Independence Day today. Yeah, they won't get one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Phil, you're back home, mate. I am. I just got back from a... Uh... A little five-day, uh, 2,800 mile, which is around 4,000 k journey around the northwest part of the United States. Awesome. Yep. Very nice. And, and I'm very kind of proud. I'm proud of this, but I was scared. I actually almost ran out of fuel. I literally was at zero miles left in the tank when I rolled into the gas station. And it wasn't like driving around the gas station to burn it out. No, I rolled in neutral into the gas station. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, man. Now, you see, I get in my car. My car's American, so I trust it implicitly. And it reads zero as I start my journey. Still gets me there. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> big, big ass reserve. And, uh, I was sweating it. I got to say, I was sweating it. Uh, Chris, how was first day at university? It was so fucking dull. <laughs> <laughs> so, listen, boys, boys, seriously, don't clap him. He should have done this two years ago. He's had a two. No, you got it. You got it. You got it. What is he? Twenty-one now or something? Twenty. Twenty Five. years old, and he's finally reached puberty and got himself off to uni. But he's still. <laughs> he's still. <laughs> he's still. And, and he's got one of these. He's got one of these yeah, really weird student necklaces yeah, he, too. Yeah, he's, tur- he's turned into Mister T. He you know? could. He could do a Mohican with that, couldn't he? Yeah. yeah. But you know, as long as he was productive in his two years off, not getting anybody pregnant. Uh, in, in that uh, case, that, he was productive, but that's about the only way. Productive and pregnant don't go together, Phil. Just saying, like we've got to move on because we're going. We're going for a new shortened, shortened show. Uh, we're, we're, we try, we're trying. Questions. Questions. Bore <laughs> <all> our, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to not bore all our. We're trying not to bore all our viewers. Honestly, and listeners. we don't even get to talk fish anymore. We get cut to, cut short from talking fish now. Okay? Well, 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 really. No, we can talk all that shit when I've got the guest on, um, and the guest <laughs> is coming on in a second. Now, you guys uh, know who this is going to be, but this guy is one of the best known people in cricket anywhere in the world. He captain England for four years straight. He's got over 30,000 first class runs, uh, uh, nearly 6,000 of those in tests as well, uh, including 6,200s and 182 cap for You really Wikipedia you really Jim, didn't you? I, I, did, I did look at his Wikipedia, so I fucking yeah, know if it's right. Anyway, guys, um, we, we, we're going to welcome tonight the one, the only, the great, the swingy right-handed batsman. It's NASA Hussein. Here he is. It's NASA Hussein. Everybody cheer for NASA. Um, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on one minute. NASA, you look completely different than your picture. And I, I've watched you on the tally. And I'm certain you didn't look like that. What's going on, man? Well, I am the real Nasser Sen, the rugby player. Not sure who you were expecting. Oh, <laughs> you're Nasser Hussein, the international rugby player with 37 <laughs> test caps for India. Yep. Ah, uh-huh. well, in that case, um, let's have a much better show and we can talk loads of shit and we don't have to worry about that cricket damn thing. <laughs> Nasser, welcome, mate. How are you? Thank you very much. How you guys doing? Oh, good. we're brilliant, mate. Yeah, we're good. good. I, we're good. I was really worried because I don't know shit about cricket. <laughs> we know because you've been you've been bricking it all day on the group chat. He's now going. What does bricking it mean? Yeah. So, um, NASA, say hello to Sam, who's over in Malta. Hey, Sam, you're right. Hey, Dean, you're right, mate. You good? Very well, thank you. Now, so. NASA can probably understand you, mate, because you did spend a few years up at, uh, at Newcastle, didn't you? Like, you were at um, Nova Castron, and then you went on to, what was it, Tyndale in the National League? Tyndale, yeah. I will New, I'll, I'll New, New, now. Yeah, Newcastle was really a Scottish city, really, let's be fair. <laughs> 
Well, it is uh, in the borders, and we did play a lot of rugby with, uh, yeah. with the team from the borders. Yeah. Some good memories. Some good memories coming at Newcastle. Trust me. Some good. Some good uh, tunies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, say, say hello to Chris. Hi, Nasser. Hey, Chris. How, How you doing? doing? How good, man? You? Very well, thank you. Lovely. Uh, Chris, as you can tell, has just started university, which is why he's got a really weird necklace on. It's a lot. You're an arsehole. Mate, you're going to have to take that off in the future. We can't have you wearing that on, on screen anymore. Oh, no, no. He's got to leave that on today. Oh, my God. Uh, anyway, Phil's, Phil's about to come back because, um, uh, you know, the most advanced nation on the planet, according to all Americans, can't get their fucking internet together. Um, there's NASA sitting down in, in Mumbai, and it's spot on, mate. <laughs> so, NASA, talk to us a little bit about your, your career. Playing for Novocastrians and, uh, and Tyndale is only a little bit. I mean, you, you're the all-time try scorer for uh, India, aren't you? Well, yeah, I, I, I started playing quite late, uh, to be honest. Uh, when I was 16, uh, that's when I got introduced to rugby. Uh, but didn't take too long, luckily, to, to get the hang of the game and uh, got my international debut three years uh, later, in 98. I mean, I, to be honest, didn't have a choice. Uh, to be when I got introduced to the sport because my dad used to play. So I was kind of arm twisted <laughs> into getting into the sport and uh, yeah, well, no regrets, uh, no looking back. Uh, absolutely, we loved it. Uh, had an opportunity to play uh, in the UK for Novocastrians for one season and then I went on and played for Tyndale for a couple of seasons. Really, really good time. Uh, obviously, took a took a bit of a uh, couple of months to, to get used to the Geordie accent. Uh, especially with Tyndale, because why are you, man? Why are you? Why are you, man? Why are you, man? Now, Nasser, I'm 47 yeah. years old, and I've not managed to get used to it. So, a couple of months is fair going, bud. Really, um, is. I've, I've just well, had a 67. Off, um, off, off Reedy. Um, I said, "Where are you at?" He goes, "Oh shit, it's a Monday. I'm in the pub to watch the Prem Cup final." Priority, Reedy. Cool. Moving, moving, moving on. Students. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. Because if he can't be bothered to be here, he misses out on all the good shit, doesn't he? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I, I think I think Nass has already said that anybody who joins this show tonight can come over to to Mumbai for a week. He's going to look after us all. He's going to take us out for parties, and we we might have to do one or two rugby games as well. And if you're not on this show, you can't go. Oh, me. Well, you know, yeah, as long. Well, an open as invitation. As, as long as there's a limo service on there, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be mad in the streets. Uh-uh. Oh, no, uh, NASA, back in, when was it? Uh, 2010, I think it was, when we had the Commonwealth <laughs> Games in, in Delhi, didn't we? And yep. you were captain of the, uh, the seven side. What was going through your mind? What was, what was the, uh, the emotions like then, actually running out on your home turf, captaining... Um, your country in the Commonwealth Games. Absolutely a fantastic uh, occasion for for Rugby India, for us uh, as players as well, to rub shoulders with the best in the world. Uh, we were up against, uh, in our first game against Wales, and they had just come off uh, the World Cup win uh, in sevens in 2009. Uh, we managed to score a try, so I mean, that was uh, some hey! sort for us. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't easy, but uh, uh, an amazing experience um, and actually lead up to that I think 18 months we were in training camp to I guess it paid off with that one try against Wales uh, and a couple against uh, Tonga and Canada. Did Canada kick your ass? They did. <laughs> <laughs> Spot the Canadian. <laughs> NASA, you you know, I'm not being rude here, mate, but your your hairline suggests a bit like me that you're knocking on in years now. Um, um, but you're still that, playing, aren't you? That's the only, uh, I think, similarity be, between me and the cricketer <laughs> Nasser Hussain is the receding hairline. <laughs> <laughs> it comes with the name, mate. Um, but you're, you're still playing, though. Well, struggling, to be honest. Uh, just club rugby, uh, it's, like, it's like any other player who doesn't know when to stop uh, and continues on. Yeah. Yeah, we've all been there, mate. Mike's thrown us all off because, you know, obviously we all thought we had the cricket in as (laughs) we've saying. We've all come up with amazing questions about cricket and thrown this curveball in at us. 
I've done, I've done a quick Google search anyway, uh, um, and on your Wikipedia page it says your nickname is El Nino. Care yeah. to explain? Well, um, we've got some real every, research every, and questioning. Every nickname's got a good story. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's there's nothing. I mean, El Nino was, I think, the, the hurricane or the tornado. Uh, I don't know why, why that came about, but yeah, it was it's just something that it was Nino and it became El Nino. So it wasn't, uh, there's no fancy story to it, unfortunately. Boom, a question now. <laughs> you need a better nickname, mate, clearly. <laughs> I mean, Christopher's got dozens, we just can't repeat them on air. One of them, m most of them involves derogatory swear words like dickhead and tool and wanker, but you know. No, dick, mate, dickhead is not derogatory. It's a term of endearment when we use it to you. <laughs> That's bollocks. Oh. Um, yep, yeah, still playing for the club. Uh, I play for Bombay Gymkhana. And uh, oh, really? we play at the, in the local competition uh, and at the nationals uh, for the 15 a side. So how's it be going on over there? Because what these guys may not know is, you, when you went back to India, you, um, you started uh, working as uh, the rugby development manager um, and you've worked your way up and you are now at the dizzy heights of chief executive officer for uh, Rugby India. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Yeah, it's make, been, sure, uh, make sure you it's connect been... with me on LinkedIn. <laughs> See, what did I tell you, NASA? What did I tell you earlier? We'll sort out another call between you, me, and Phil, and we'll get yep. this exchange program sorted. Posh. I look, look forward to that. Yeah, so it's been it's been a fantastic journey. I mean, obviously, uh, having an opportunity to work in rugby has been uh, amazing. Uh, to convert your passion into a career has been uh, fantastic. And uh, there's been a lot of development in, uh, in the sport over the last uh, decade in terms of just the reach, the growth, uh, women's rugby, uh, grassroots now. So there's a, there's a lot that's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, the, the inclusion of rugby sevens in the Olympics has been a, a massive boost for countries like us, uh, where the Ministry of Sports taken a bit of uh, interest. Uh, and it is, it's, it's all heading in the right, right direction. Excellent. What, what are your plans then for the, um, uh, for the Olympics next year? How, how is that preparation going? And it, has the delay helped you or do you think it's going to be a hindrance to you? Well, it is, uh, I think, a bit of both. Uh, I mean, this, this period's uh, really helped us get back to the drawing board to start thinking, rethinking uh, in terms of what... Uh, our strategies are and how we want to take things forward. But at the same time, we're uh, a bit wary that we might lose momentum uh, of what we've gained. And uh, I think retention and sustainability have been our biggest uh, focus uh, while rolling out uh, grassroots programs. And that's something that we're a bit concerned about, taking that we've uh, not had any activity for the last six months. Is that still the case? You've still got no rugby at the minute? No, not, not at the moment, none. No, mate, they've got more COVID cases than we've got salad. It's uh, about, uh, I mean, the latest is 100,000 cases a day. Uh, that's ridiculous. Ouch. Worrying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. mate, it, it makes Malta look like, you know, not a lot. <laughs> Sam, Sam was moaning about 37 cases. No, I was not moaning about 37 cases. Stop talking at your ears. Honestly. <laughs> well, um, if you want to know what that is, ladies and gentlemen, we'll put the subtitles underneath. Since, well, he'll understand it anyway because he's lived in Newcastle for a while. So, shut the Listen, Paul. Uh, <laughs> Sam, yes. can you do some subtitles for me? Because I've got no idea what you're talking about. Then. Basically, I'll, I'll pronounce my letters then. Basically, since our last conversation, then on Sunday we had another massive spike with 106 cases. Really? Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're now up to 23, 20, 23 deaths now. Which was last this time last week it was fifteen, sixteen. Wow, that is so, going up quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. And it's in it's in the elderly homes now and that's the problem, isn't it? And Malta's yeah, exactly. like a country that has an elder age generation. So. Yeah. Mm. But a hundred thousand yeah. cases and that's oh my god, mate. It is a bit that's scary. Scary. Go and put your go and put your Mr. T necklace back on, mate. That was so cool. 
sorry. I know you said keep a straight face when you messaged me about that, but I can't. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It is. It is. It's just like, anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah. Phil, Phil, Phil's back. So, Phil, you, you, you've got a few questions until you were rudely booted off by Zoom. Yeah, sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nasser, I got a few questions on the growth of the game uh, within India. Where was it, like, you know, roughly speaking, in a number of participants in uh, 2008 versus where it is today and where you expect it to be, let's say, in five years? Well, in 2008, we probably had just a handful of uh, clubs and uh, players that were involved in the sport. I think today we've got uh, one third of the districts playing. So we've got about 700 odd districts in the country, and we've got about 250 odd districts that are playing rugby. Uh, and it, in 2008, probably the sport was restricted more to elite clubs and people who could uh, work probably socio-economically doing well. Uh, but now it's a mass sport. Uh, it's penetrated into tier two cities, rural India, and that's where the actual talent is coming from. I think going ahead, that is the future of the sport. And uh, what we've kind of stumbled upon uh, while we've gone out with this uh, sort of development initiative has been uh, how the values of the sport and how the sport yeah. is being a catalyst for change. So there's been yeah. social transformation through sport. Absolutely. Uh, and how it's actually making a difference in the lives of these kids, especially the, the little mm. girls that are getting involved in the game. Yeah, absolutely. So, had, so Nasser, if you had to put a number on the number of people that are playing or picked up the ball, what would you estimate that to be? Well, in 2000 and 19, uh, we did the Get Into Rugby program, uh, which is a, girl, a world rugby initiative. And we reached out to, I think, 215,000 uh, participants uh, who got exposed to the game. Uh, I think from what uh, sort of stats we've done, there have been about 20% uh, that have gone on to play contact rugby. Uh, the remaining, maybe 25, 30% continue playing non-contact touch rugby. Uh, and I mean, the 50 have been exposed and have been aware of the game. And we're trying to build upon that uh, going forward. Uh, but it's not even a, a fraction of the population that we have. And that's the potential that we need to reach out to. I think this just shows the, the growth in the game that we've seen elsewhere. So, I mean, you, some of you guys are in, know what we do with the, the Libyan uh, rugby over, over there. And, you know, across that whole um, uh, continent, I think the growth of the game is massive at the minute. And the amount of people that are coming into the game. And one of the things I like is the amount of, of young people that are coming into the game, not just expats, but the amount of, of young people and even the amount of women and girls that are coming into the game in countries that perhaps a few years ago, we would never dream of them having a women's rugby team. Um, and I think there's something about rugby, isn't there, that means that it, it, it sort of transcends all of those natural barriers and we get a really good growth in the game now. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. I mean, uh, I think the growth of women's rugby has been uh, much faster than men's rugby in India, at least. Uh, and uh, we've, we've just seen uh, girls taking on to the sport. And it's a very, like you rightly said, it's, it's against normal paradigm in terms of mindset, uh, in terms of how at least India is perceived to be more male-influenced and not so, and the women are kind of sort of treated inferior and it's, I think, just lack of opportunity that they've been given. And that's something that we've uh, managed to unfold and, and they've just taken it with, uh, with open arms and, and it, I mean, the response has been overwhelming. So how does it get funded over there? Uh, so, we, I mean, we do get some funding from World Rugby uh, and uh, we have corporate sponsors. So we've got Sociere General who are major sponsors. And uh, yeah, they are the ones who are, I think just it's- Just lift up a bit more, mate, so that we can give Society General a good, yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll just pause there. Uh, Society General, make sure you give them more money, please. They need more money. Um, yeah, so they're- you know, A bit like Axiwee's here. We always make sure the brand's shown. 
Yeah, I need I need to put put my camera far away. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Phil will get his his bottle of Pepsi in a minute and stick it right in the camera. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Talk to us about the way the leagues are structured and whether whether they are funded and sponsored and things like that. We've got a national uh, tournament that happens, and it actually dates back to 1924 uh, that it was first played. So since the British time, uh, still That's being carried forward. Uh, in fact, the trophy that we play for has the English rose on it, and I mean history has goes back to the Calcutta Cup uh, that England and Scotland play for, and Scotland, a, Scotland versus yeah. England. Scotland's on top. Scotland versus England. All right, fair enough. Hey, we invented the game. Fuck off. <laughs> what? what? Oh, shut up. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, there's uh, so that's the national tournament. I mean, off late with. The recognition from the Ministry of Sport, uh, because uh, rugby is part of the Olympics, there's a lot more interest, and we've got rugby sevens that's uh, got a massive boost, uh, and we get out of the 36 provinces or states or counties, as you may, uh, in the country, we get about 24 that participate uh, in men, women, and age grade uh, competition. That's good. That's really good. So what's it like on a typical weekend then? Um, if we if we came to Mumbai, um, we we said right, take take us and show us what rugby is really like. So it would, it would depend uh, on which time of the year, because different parts of the country have a different uh, time when they play because of weather conditions and uh, and so on. So I mean, typically your major playing centres would be Bombay, Calcutta, uh, Delhi, and Bangalore in South India, and uh, the season would go on like Bombay Calcutta play from about May all the way up to September, October. Uh, Delhi would actually start in uh, September, October and go on till about February, March because uh, that's the coolest time of the year for them. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there would be club games on weekends. Uh, I mean, few of these, uh, these cities. I think our biggest challenge is infrastructure as well uh, to have access to facilities to play the sport. Uh, but that's getting better now with uh, universities being involved in it that have uh, those sort of facilities that they offer for national tournaments. Talk to us just about Mumbai. Obviously, that's where I know you, you're involved in, in rugby nationally. But talk about it locally. Um, how many teams are there around the city? How do kids get involved? It, does it work in schools as well? So, Mumbai has uh, six clubs uh, and they play... Uh, during the season, both sevens and fifteens. Uh, there's a schools tournament uh, which we do, which is non-contact rugby as well as sevens rugby. Kids get an opportunity to run out, uh, I mean, represent their school and then go on and represent their district team and then their state team at the nationals. Uh, so there's a sort of a pathway for players to progress uh, as well. And now that the sports part of the universities, uh, kids that do well at the nationals uh, get scholarships, get uh, admissions through sports uh, quotas. So yeah, so it is. I mean, we are seeing benefits for the for the player as well uh, once they uh, sort of perform or get results. Did it? Did did uh, maybe I didn't catch you there, Nasser? But um, is rugby? As a like a, a core subject in schools now, as in with your physical education, or is it just something that you take to a school and run a run a session with them? It uh, it isn't a, a part of the curriculum as yet, uh, but it is part of the School Games Federation of India. Uh, okay. So they they handle all the the sports across all the schools. So rugby is one of the sports that's uh, recognised and played under the School Games Federation uh, banner. And similarly, yeah. the universities have a, a university's uh, sports association that run university sports. Would would there be any difference then if it was a, a, as part of the curriculum, or or would it just be the same as what it would be now? I mean, um, in regards to numbers playing it, you know, and, and being able to be get the, the, the sport well, more well known, if you like. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely help uh, to be part of the curriculum, but there'd be there wouldn't be that much of a difference, I would think. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, if you are recognized as part of the curriculum, it obviously makes things uh, a lot easier. 
Yeah, massively. We're, we're, we're at that stage where we're trying to uh, get into the curriculum in Malta, um, where it's not just, you know, someone from the clubs or the union going into to do sessions in, in schools. Um, although, you know, you can cover um, quite a lot of ground and, you know, get the numbers up and things like that that's participating, you know, passing a ball around or, you know, actually getting them to join, come down to session and join clubs and things. But um, if you can get that as a core, you know, part of the curriculum and involved as a PE class, it, it, it's massive difference. It will make big difference in regards to the sport being more well known. It might not get you better numbers, but the skill level will start to go up because it's actually been played in the school as a part of the thing, you know? Sure, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we've been trying to uh, include it as a, as a curriculum in the university. So universities normally have a, a certificate or a diploma or a degree program uh, for yeah. sports. And uh, we're trying to get rugby as part of that uh, going forward. Yeah, if you can get that, there'd be a massive difference, I think, for you. Especially when it comes to the, you know, the more elite players. Especially with have already a standard going into it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Especially with uh, uh, focusing on coaching and uh, match officiating. So, that yeah. sort of degrees. Uh, I mean, you obviously have the World Rugby uh, certifications that we, we do. But this would also be an additional sort of uh, bonus for the participant. Cool. cool. I tell you what, that's um, that that's a huge progress that you guys are making, and we'll talk more about that. And then we're going to dig into the real Nasser Hussein and just ask him what some of his best nights out were while he was captain in India. Uh, but we'll see you with all of those really, really hard and difficult questions right after this short break. <laughs> When you need clear and concise match official communication systems, look no further than the brand new AxiWe AT350. Radios are always that they're always useful, they always help us, especially AxiWe's, where all three of us can be open at any time and can have open communication. Available now from refcomsglobal.net. Invest in profits into match official development worldwide. to the second part of uh, 22 dropouts we're joined tonight by the wonderful the masterful it's mr nasser hussein not that one but this one um nasser um welcome back mate uh, phil you want to just touch on match official development in, in india don't you yeah so one of the things that we're really focused on over here in the americas is with the potential growth aspect of it is getting in front of the of the growth curve with the master development program. What are you guys doing as far as putting a program in place? How, you, how are you uh, looking at uh, strategically aligning it and building it in a platform more sustainable? So in terms of uh, training and education, uh, we, we follow the World Rugby uh, sort of modules. Uh, we've got trainers uh, from World Rugby who are certified and we've got educators as well now. Uh, so we, I think over the years we've managed to uh, create a, a sort of environment which is self-sustainable. Uh, starting off with just having a couple of people who were level ones, level twos. We've reached a stage where we have a couple of trainers, about eight, 10 educators and quite a few uh, level twos uh, in coaching and match officiating. Uh, there are a few now in the last couple of years that have uh, managed to secure a level three uh, World Rugby certification in match officiating and have also been part of the Asia Rugby panel uh, in terms of refereeing and a couple of them are women and that's been fantastic uh, to see them uh, take on to that sort of mantle. So just to follow up to that question and 
who's who's developing i guess is it is it the club's responsibility to develop the match officials down at the provincial level or lower or is it uh, governance uh would be a mix uh, so we obviously look at the national front uh, but we also empower our state associations or our provinces and our clubs to identify who the people are and then put them forward uh, for us to help support them in terms of uh, be it uh, assessments or feedback so that they can improve and then we try and scout so to say at the local tournaments and then the ones who have potential we kind of pull them up and give them opportunities at junior national tournaments and then if they do kind of perform then give them an opportunity to to referee the women's seniors and then the men's so that's the sort of uh, structure that's in place at the moment but i mean having said that it's still a a, a huge gap uh, in in and in the ratio of players to match officials and that's something that uh, is uh, an ongoing sort of uh, challenge that's sir it's not just in india that is a world <laughs> problem <laughs> Now, in terms yes. of your uh, match official development, then, uh, are you more concerned with developing uh, officials for the 15s game or the 7s game? Uh, would be both. I mean, uh, it's it's much easier to get them uh, on the 7s uh, sort of circuit because uh, it's easier to referee. And the thing is, you can provide adequate feedback to them and through the course of two, three days of a 7s tournament, uh, you can monitor and gauge their performance uh, so it becomes much easier working with a a group of referees over a seven tournament as opposed to 15s where you don't get that much opportunity to referee now the um, the question that's on everybody's lips tonight nasa is just talk to us about your first test century uh, and how you felt when you let it go down <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, I, uh, did you play cricket as a kid? Um, I did, yeah. I mean, being Indian, I don't think uh, there are two ways about it. You, you do end up playing cricket, uh, even if it's uh, just socially with, with a group of friends. Yeah. It, it's, it's like your equivalent of going out for a kickabout with your friend down the park. You just go and have a, have, have a, couple, of it, a couple of overs. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no, you see, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, and it's always going to be a challenge that you can take a, a cricket ball and a, a, and a bat and you can literally set up anywhere. You can take a football and you can kick it around anywhere. Um, rugby's, rugby's more of a challenge when it comes to being that game that people just do in the park. It's only for geeks like us who, like, like you, Nasser, you've been brought up with it. You're probably, your first toy was probably a rugby ball instead of a teddy ball. Bear or, or something, you know, that makes it a little bit more difficult. But when we get to that point, and I see a real shift now in the, in the, in the subcontinent and over in, in the Gulf region, that more and more kids are happy to go into a park and throw a rugby ball between themselves. Yeah, it is. I mean, without a doubt, it is, uh, it is changing. And uh, I mean, that's, that's, from our perspective, it's a good thing. Uh, and we're happy to see that sort of change. It is customary that we put all of our our guests on the spot, and tonight, of course, is no different. So, first question from me tonight, NASA, is: Every party has a party trick. We all have done one. We might not be very proud of it, but when you go out and people turn to you do you pick up a guitar do you pick up a microphone or do you do something completely outrageous what's your go-to party trick well i'm no good with a musical instrument or uh can't sing to save my life so it'll have to be something outrageous uh i, w I would follow lead of somebody else and and just uh, you you can't like sword swallow or anything else like that as a party trick just to impress us tonight maybe you no. should start practicing like uh, mr t because i mean you, you know chris started a trend tonight didn't he so nasa i mean just mm -hmm. remind me how many how many uh, <laughs> games and things like that at commonwealth or olympics did did you go to with india uh, 
won Commonwealth Games, two Asian Games, and obviously a lot of Test matches uh, with the country. So 37 caps, I think, in 15s, and quite a few sevens tournaments. I mean, I was lucky to have started early uh, and played through uh, till uh, till I could. To be fair. Hey, we all played till we could, just so I was couldn't from quite yeah. an early age. Could we, Christopher? Hey? Yeah, just see, yeah. At, at yeah. this point, you normally do that at the camera turning. So we'll oh, let okay. you do that now. Yeah, yeah, well done. Um, so, mate, on all of those trips, there must have been some really memorable tours and memorable nights out. What stands out most in your mind? I think, I mean, I officially, well, I would like to have officially hung up my boots in uh, end of 2014. Uh, and then we, I traveled with the team as a, well, not as an official, I went in fact, uh, there was a tournament in Pakistan and uh, a team was going across. And uh, since I was a world rugby trainer, they'd asked me to go across and run a couple of uh, coaching courses uh, around the tournament. So I traveled with the team to go across and a pretty decent uh, Indian squad had, I think, about 14 players from the Indian Army. And we kind of rocked up to the border where you actually cross over by foot. Uh, and we spent the night there and next morning we were going to walk, walk across. And we got a call from, from the head office of the, the Army. Uh, saying that, sorry, the clearance of our 14 players have been denied and they cannot travel to Pakistan because of security concerns. So, so we had this uh, coach from New Zealand and 12 players. Uh, and they were like, we've got you uh, and we've got a manager. <laughs> so we were had a, he's like, you, you don't have a choice. I said, I don't even have boots. He's like, it's all right, you've got trainers. Uh, and so we, we went across with, 12 players, myself and the manager, uh, and we played this tournament because uh, if we had not gone, we'd have got fined. Uh, yeah. And we, we, we lost closely to Uzbekistan and we beat Pakistan. So I think that was, uh, without a doubt, uh, uh, one of the memorable tours because, I mean, it, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was different because, I mean, we had nothing to lose and everyone kind of played it just completely freely and I mean enjoyed it uh, yeah it was funny because uh, we obviously the uh, the coach would had 40 minutes of being alone on the uh, in the in the stands with nobody around him uh, and he's like it was probably the most lonely 40 minutes and then another 40 minutes <laughs> with no one to talk to or discuss or anything and he and he had nothing to do he, he couldn't make subs he couldn't do anything they were just 14 players. That's that's <laughs> epic. That's that's an epic story. I, I tell you sounds, what, that's just like that's just typical of those border issues over there, though, isn't it? No, I mean it is one of those things which you have no control over, and it is what it is. You had to just get on with it and make the most of it, and I guess that's what we did, and, and that's one of the reasons why we enjoy it. I guess. Sounds like a local vets game over here. That does. Oh, <laughs> so <certainly> only both person. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, that sounds more like the police versus the fire service. <laughs> that's the sort. That's the sort of I'll game drink, you get. I'll there. drink to that. I'll drink to that. What What are you drinking? To are you drinking Diet Pepsi to that? Are you okay? Surprising, surprising Diet Pepsi. Yeah, Steve, if you're watching, we still need money from Pepsi. We'll get it. We just need the support. Pepsi, this point. Mm -hmm. I, I, and if NASA sits up straight, he can get Society General into the shot <laughs> a little bit more, uh, and, and maybe they'll help out a little bit. So, what's it like? Oh, you, you talked about the uh, the different seasons. Uh, it's actually because so why, why we play between May, June till September is because that's when the monsoon set in, and that's when cricket cannot be played. So, unfortunately, that's the window we get. Otherwise, the rest of the year, cricket kind of hogs and takes over uh, all the facilities in the country. No, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Can we, they, uh, they've had enough. They can, get, they can go on tour anyway to other countries. Mike, Mike, we need you to drop a logo or a symbol where it's no cricket allowed. 
No cricket allowed, yeah. I should stop inviting England cricket captains onto the show, really? shouldn't I? So, David Gower, I know you've messaged me on LinkedIn, but the answer's a big... <clears throat> how, how does it work, then, over in India with, with a national competition? Because, obviously, it's such a vast country, um, and you are at different stages around, around the country as well, in terms of your rugby <laughs> development. Given all this with monsoons and heat waves and <coughs> cricket going on, how do you in manage COVID. to get these guys to, uh, together to to have a national tournament? So, in, in terms of uh, the national 15s, we've got a, a three tier tournament. So, you've got 12 teams in each of the three competitions with a promotion relegation system in place. Uh, and what we do is we play a a 10-day tournament. So, teams come in from all over uh, to one location and you kind of play every alternate day. So, it's quite demanding on the teams, uh, especially the ones that make it through uh, to the final stages. They probably play four games in about 10 days, which is quite taxing on the players. Uh, but, unfortunately, that's the best uh, sort of scenario where you can... Uh, I mean, we'd love to do a home and away and travel around to play, but it, it kind of uh, the distances and the costs involved are sort of a, a, an obstacle in doing in doing that. Yeah, it would it would need a massive cash injection, and and also for for anybody doing that, it would you know rugby would have to probably be at the next level again before that's something that you guys could consider. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's still a, an amateur sport. Everyone has a day job. Uh, even the players in the national team. Uh, I mean, they, they. I mean, when we used to be part of camp, we go for morning training, go to work, and come back and go back for training in the evening. And I mean, that that was just a, a normal sort of a day uh, for any uh, national sort of athlete. And when when you look at it like that, if you're trying to compete with the likes of Wales and Canada and, and people like that at a Commonwealth Games, um, that makes it really hard. It, it's, it, it's a glass ceiling that's almost impossible to break, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it is difficult. I mean, it's uh, because you're, you're playing at the professional level, but you are super amateur uh, in your approach. And, and that's something that needs to change if we need to step up and compete with, uh, I mean, not the likes of... Wales, but at least uh, the Asian countries uh, to begin with. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's something that we need to uh, work on uh, and kind of focus on uh, if we want to uh, make a mark on the, on the international front. So, Nasser, um, knowing you got some big international competitions with the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games, what's your, what's your goal and objective for, as far as uh, competing at those levels in the, in the near future and in expanding out, let's say, another 10 years? I think as a, as a union, our, our focus over the last four or five years has actually been grassroots development. Uh, the, the high performance was kind of uh, set aside and, and not given a priority at the moment. Uh, so our focus was to spread the game, to establish uh, aid in schools, at universities, get a lot of the, the youth involved. And I think uh, we've uh, done reasonably well, I would say. And I think we've reached a stage where now we need to focus on the high performance as well and give them the due sort of uh, support uh, to start, uh, I think, making an impact on the Asian front. I mean, for us, it would be, I mean, we're currently probably ranked 11 or 12 in Asia out of the 34 countries that play. Uh, so in the next four or five years, it would be pretty uh, possible to break into the top five. And that's something realistic if we actually support them with, with that sort of a longevity uh, in terms of uh, investment or resources to that group. So, Nasa, I know that uh, what time is it the bottom of the hour where you are right now? It is uh, half past 12 at night. So, yeah. Right. Where I'm from in Canada, we also have a, our own half-hour time zone. So I, I understand the half-hour issue. I really do. Um, listen, we're going to take a very short break, uh, but we'll be back uh, with uh, this week's rumours. 
if there are any. Uh, there's been lots of rugby, but we'll find out if there are any new rumours, and we'll see you straight after this. <laughs> It's been amazing during lockdown when I've been dancing. It's meant that I can come to the park and put my headphones in. I just listen to my music without disturbing anyone else. They're the only headset that I've found so far that don't fall off. They stay on and they're not uncomfortable on your ears because they just rest outside your ears instead of actually going in. Uh, so welcome back to part three and it is time for the rumour mill. Now don't forget you can keep in touch with us, keep up to date on our social media channels when my 22 actually bothers to update them. But you can check them out, there might well be something up to date and interesting on there. Just go to Twitter, Instagram or Facebook and search at 22 Dropouts. Um, Sam's trying to hang himself because he knows he hasn't posted anything I did. I did. While. You're lying. You're telling stories again. You wonder I'm, why you sorry. I'm sorry. Nobody can understand you because your accent. You wonder why you don't have any hair. You're lying, son. Sam, Sam I can vouch. <laughs> Sam did post on social media. Really? I shared his post. Oh, well done, Sam. Well done, Sam. You're I'm welcome, impressed man. with you. Very, very kind I am of impressed. You. I see your hair is growing back, Phil. It's good to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I see yours is fucking running off, Sam. Yeah, it's starting to come back. Yeah, like mine. In fact, in fact, you know what? Just look around the screens now. I was going to make that. Count. And then, and we go one, yeah, two. Hold on. We've all got similar haircuts apart Chris, from the bottom. Chris, Chris Mulroy, who wants to be BA Barakas, is now going for the aha look. Listen. Yeah, we're all old enough to know this person's name when I make the comment, except for Chris Mulroy. Does anybody know, remember the singer from the 1990s, or Rick, Rick Ashley? Yeah. I know exactly. I know yeah. Rick Ashley. I am the one and only. That's not him. That's, that's Rick Ashley right there, except with that's a... Rick Ashley. That's not Rick Ashley, you muppet. You freaking okay. more. I know that. My Who God, the fuck was that then? Well, some other fucking idiot you don't remember the name of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but was I didn't sing it. Hey, yeah, Sam, if you were to sing that in English, we'd probably help you out. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> Anywho. Are you okay then, yeah. Chris? Because we're, ju we're just watching you dancing a bit. Rick Astley. Rick Astley did... Um, I'm never, never going to give, give you up. up. It's I'm never going to give you up. I'd be telling you. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna put you down. That one. Never gonna let you down. Hang on. Guys, I've lost the plot. What the fuck are we talking about, Rick Astley? Rumor for? mill. Rugby show. Rumor mill. It's the rumor, rumor mill. Um, now, NASA, we don't like to put you on the spot because you are a guest, but uh, tough shit we are. <laughs> um, what's the biggest rumor this week in Indian rugby? It doesn't have to be true. It just got to be good. Well, we've got two players who would probably make it uh, internationally. I'd, I'd go with one male, one female, Prince Khatri and Sweetie Kumari. Do you know what? It, it, it's a double-edged sword, though, isn't it? Um, I mean, that's a fantastic opportunity. And it says a lot for the programme and the clubs over there um, that, that people on the international stage are looking uh, at them. But at the same time, you, you've got this dichotomy that you're – they are taking your best talent away. How, how does that fit within the, the Indian rugby program? Well, uh, from our point of view, they would be uh, preparing them for our international duty. So there would be obviously an okay. arrangement where they would be let out to come back and represent the country. And playing at that level, uh, the experience and exposure that they'd get uh, would be an added bonus. Uh, and hopefully they'll come back much better players than they are. Ambassadors for Rugby India as well? Yeah, yeah they would be. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've in fact just had uh, the Unstoppables campaign uh, where we've selected three women as ambassadors of, uh, of Rugby India. And uh, they would be, I mean, they are already role models and mentors of the sport. 
inspiring the next generation of women in rugby uh, and this is kind of uh, we've officially announced it uh, and given their names up to asia rugby well done excellent now um in terms of um, again we don't like to put you on the spot with but we're going to if you were to look around um the match officials at the moment in uh, in rugby india who's the one name that you would pick out that that you could say this man or this woman could very easily get picked up for uh, international duty for example onto the world series um i'd go with uh, with priya bansal uh, a girl uh, young has played uh, at the highest level in india and has also refereed at the asian circuit uh, i think any sort of uh, additional experience especially in in a in an environment outside of asia will really i think uh, test her challenge her and uh, put her on on the map i would say uh, that's brilliant and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see a lot more of her in the future and look if we can help um, do anything to to help her career uh, you know you've only got to reach out um, what can we do well stick her on the show and take the piss out of her a bit but um yeah, just pictures of music advice though <laughs> yeah um whatever although do you know what she could come on to a pub quiz team and be our music specialist because clearly I'm not yeah clearly you're not yeah i haven't found something i am good at yet so i'll keep trying anyway um no chris um rumor time what have yeah. you got because tom's not here today so i know sam's got fuck all and oh, I know I'm Phil's got fuck all. Have I got to be better than rugby rules tonight? You've you've got to be Tom Reed tonight. I've got to be oh, better than rugby rules tonight. I can't believe that. You see that, Sam, Phil? Sam, it, fuck up. Get your turn in a minute. Stop bitching. I'll come. Oh, Sam, no. I'll come no, back no, to you in a minute. Sam. Don't worry. No, no. If there's it's no, about Scotland, no don't love. bother. There's no love. No, no. You no. get your turn in a minute. You then. Sh- in a minute. We need a shorter show, so there's no love. I can't pander to you anymore, Samuel. Chris. Anywho, Anywho. Um, it seems as though Anthony Watson is going to be on the move at the end of this season. Uh, he is a free agent, as we know. Uh, Racing 92 are expected to lose three high-profile players in Vrimi Vakatawa, Simon Zebo, and Teddy Toma, um, who are rumoured to go to Gloucester, uh, Vakatawa is, and Toma is rumoured to go to Quinns. Save that for another day. Um, so... It seems as though Anthony Watson may be on the move to Racing 92. Very good. Now, could you do that um, again, just so that we know you're not reading it from rook.co.uk? I don't know what you're talking about. I never heard of the website. <laughs> uh, no, that's interesting. And, and I'll tell you what, Racing has got a few challenges coming up uh, at the end of this season. Um, is it this season or is it, are we in, are we in next season yet? I'm, I'm we're, in, we're still in this season. Also, very quickly, um, the seven series results and um, winners have been announced, all the, all the awards and stuff, um, because obviously the series has been cut short. Um, so both uh, New Zealand men, men and women have won the series. Um, no notable England names as per, apart from uh, Dan Norton winning uh, the Mark of Excellence. Uh, for becoming the first ever sevens player to score 350 tries on the seat on the seat uh, on the seven season. What what you've got to look out for is next week's announcement where World Rugby will tell us who's won the next year's World Series because they're just going to flip a coin, I think, and award it to New Zealand anyway because we won't have a series next year. That'd be a pretty fucking or... big coin, that though, ain't it? <laughs> no, they just they, they just use one side for New Zealand and the other side for the USA, don't they, Phil? Fiji. <laughs> Fiji. <laughs> Sam, you've got a rumour. That's a funny rumour, man. So, rumour, it's a really corker one this week, right? Honestly, it's top end. Are you ready for this? Right? Seriously. There was a rumour that Joy Neville, right, could not continue her role as assistant referee at the weekend because she dropped her flag as she was about to put it up. But hold on a minute. No. She actually managed to continue her job and hold on to the flag, unlike someone else we know. Who <laughs> Who's that? Who's, who would, 
what AR, what self-respecting well, assistant referee would ever the drop their flag at well, the home well, of rugby at Twickenham? Well, I don't know anybody who I, dares do that. I don't think we should name names, but I think Nassar should be able to, to guess who this might be. Nas, who do you think, who do you think did, did that, mate? Who do you think, who do you, who do you, who do you think Nas, was the absolute tit, right, that couldn't hold on to his flag? And I'll give you a clue because I said tit. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to name. I'm going to point. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So basically, um, Joy Neville was, you know, absolutely really good call. To be fair, because it was just it was like, it was it was, it, on the line, and, and it was bang on. Really, really good call. She went to the flag up, and it must have caught in her pocket or something. And went, and she juggled it and caught it and kept on going and put the flag up. But you know, we know someone else, a guy called Mike Mulroy. Tit. Never heard of him. Sounds like a sounds like right. a prick. Yeah. Okay. Um, who did that at Twickenham, but didn't really hold on to the flag and just left it lying on the floor. There is no video evidence at all of this. You're making it up. Yes, there bloody well is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't on TV, was it? Uh, yes, um, it was. Because you've got the clip. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, it was. <laughs> Wellington College uh, also with Will Greenwood mentioned in their coaching ranks. So there are the two teams in the tunnel. We are ready to welcome them to the Stadium Bowl. They know their way around the rugby field, Sam Howard. Yeah, we've got two powerhouses of school rugby here playing. Warwick constantly in the final under 15s and under 18s. Wellington always very, very strong. This should be an absolute cracker of a game. I can't wait. Well, it's underway. 12 phases, but fair play to the Warwick defence. They made tackles and tackles again. Wellington didn't really go anywhere then. Ball out to the right then that comes through Thomas and now they're trying to find a little bit of room down this near side but uh, touch thank you despite the touch judge move, losing his flag Max Watson had stepped on the whitewash touch Thank you. I like the look of the fly half of Don Hugh. Was not. Absolutely. That was the best rumour of the night, that was. Best rumour. Right. Uh, anyway, guys, it's been lovely to have a chat with everybody tonight. Uh, especially lovely to welcome England cricket legend Nasser Hussein. Uh, apparently, he's quite good at rugby too, uh, and he's probably scored more tries than centuries. Um, uh, so, from me, from from the guys on the twenty-two tonight, from from NASA over in India, and we wish you and we wish everybody in India rugby the very, very best. We know you're strange and you've got an extra half hour, so four and a half yeah. hours. Uh, ahead over over there. So thank yeah, you. Stay well tonight. and stay healthy. Yeah, you, you, you keep. You know, and, and given the amount of COVID cases, mate, stay at home. Yeah. <laughs> do everything on Zoom like we do. Uh, but we'll see you next week with. Uh, uh, well, actually, we're going to try again next week with Peter Bracken. So if yeah. you enjoyed this fuck no, up the first is. time, you're going to enjoy it again next week. We'll see you then. Take care and good night. Good night. Take care, mate. Thank <laughs> you.